I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. They can provide more information uh, during their introductory statements as well. Uh, but to my left here, starting with Chris Newlands. Uh, Chris is going to talk to us primarily about IoT connectivity within the framework of sustainable development goals. He's uh, followed by Dr. Minda Suchan from MDA Space out of Canada. Uh, next, we have Dr. Kate Figgis from Esri and all things imagery. <laughs> And then uh, on my far left here, we have Dr. Prashant Marpu from Bayonet AI talking to us about the integration of, of some of these technologies and the implications of AI. So without further ado, um, we'll just go in order here with my notes and hand it over to Chris for his own introduction to tell us a little bit about his company and then give us some of his initial thoughts on the future of sustainability as it's related to Earth observation. Chris. Thank you, Aaron. Um, my name is Chris Newlands. I am not a doctor. I think that's the first thing to say, <laughs> which is quite, quite, quite stark. Um, I am the founder and chief executive of a, an organisation called Space I. I in Scottish means yes. It also means always. Uh, I'm ex-military, so you'd send your emails uh, yours AI, which is yours always. Uh, but it works phonetically, and because I'm Scottish, I like good value. Uh, I space AYE.com was $100,000 for EYE. It was $30 for AYE. So uh, being Scottish, I think it's always good to get good value. So I'm here pretty much as a consumer rather than a technician. I have a technical team, uh, but we are very interested in and control the relationship between real-time satellite imagery and Internet of Things data. Uh, so fundamentally, the world in context from space in real time is within our gift and we are actually working with some of the biggest brands on our planet and we hope to do an amazing set of societal um, um, projects. We're working with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals teams. Uh, we're looking at wildfires, we're looking at pandemic management, earthquakes, the ability not just to see the earthquake results, but actually identify the survivors using biometrics. Uh, many aspects are really exciting, uh, and I think we can change the world from a sustainability perspective. Um, uh, although rockets do send satellites into space, not ideal, they are solar powered, but fundamentally the data that you can capture from space will help you make better, more informed decisions, uh, will save lives, could save the planet, uh, in my humble opinion, and I believe space in conjunction with technology is a really compelling and intoxicating opportunity, and I'm not alone. Thanks, Chris. Our next speaker is Minda, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. My name is Minda Suhan. I am with MDA Space. I am the Vice President of Geo Intelligence. So uh, it's exciting to be here at InnoGeo and a part of WGIC. Uh, I, uh, in ge uh, my geo intelligence business, one uh, business line is really focused on Earth observation. And that's really applicable to all the discussions that I've been having here. Our legacy and history is really based on radar data. We do synthetic aperture radar data. Uh, we had a RadarSat-1 uh, that was uh, we're a, a premier space uh, company in Canada. And so RadarSat-1 was a SAR satellite that was sovereign owned by Canada. Uh, RadarSat 2 was a PPP, so when we talk about different investment opportunities and ways to move forward in space, uh, public-private partnership was a very successful one with the Canadian government. We still operate RadarSat 2 today and sell the data commercially. And so uh, that is something that we're very excited, very proud of. It's uh, been in operations for over 15 years. And so we provide uh, radar data to both governments and industry and businesses and commercial customers throughout uh, globally. So, and then uh, we also built uh, RadarSat Constellation Mission, RCM. That was a three satellite system for the Canadian government. And currently, we are most excited about our continuity mission for Radar Set 2 called Chorus. Chorus is going to be another radar system. It's going to be a two satellite system where we have a broad area uh, satellite in front using C band, again, that synthetic aperture radar satellite, which is then going to be followed by a smaller satellite but much higher resolution for an X-band satellite. And so that's what we're focused on and prioritizing in my business today. Great, thanks, Minda. Kate. Hi, 
Testing. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron, for the invitation to be here. I'm Kate Fickus. I'm the director of imagery and remote sensing solutions at Esri. Uh, Esri's been historically known as a GIS company for the past 55 years. Uh, so it might sound funny that we're leaning into imagery, but we're really at an exciting time where combining GIS and imagery together uh, makes the duo more powerful uh, in combination than apart. Uh, and really, the, the two fields have grown very separately, but now we're hearing about new exciting phenomenologies that are readily accessible, new star missions, IoT connections, uh, and, and more. And a lot of our users identify as GIS users. They want to make sure that they're um, connecting their solutions to spatial data, uh, answering the question of where. Uh, and it's our job at Esri to help them access the data, manage the data, and then bring context to their imagery through GIS. Uh, so we have a, once, once we get over the hurdle of having an end-to-end -end imagery solution, we can then start to combine it with GIS data um, for any type of industry. Uh, and you know, we hear customers uh, that talk about seeing new, exciting commercial satellite imagery coming on board, but no idea how to actually access it. Um, as a background in um, optical remote sensing, SAR is in intimidating even to me. So <laughs> being able to provide uh, uh, access and easily usable data, going from data to decisions and uh, GIS framing imagery is, is our goal and uh, we're excited for the future. Thanks, Kate. And, uh, and to Kate's left, we have Prashant. I'll turn the floor over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here, Aaron. Uh, I studied here in Germany, so it, uh, it feels nice to come back uh, here uh, every now and then. But I, I just realized that it's been a decade since, uh, since I was last in Germany. But anyway, so my name is Prashant, uh, and I work uh, for a company called Bayanath uh, in, in uh, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. In a week, uh, it's going to be Space 42. So Bayanath has uh, 50 years of history working on mapping and surveying in, in the UAE, largely in the UAE. Uh, over the last few years, uh, we accelerated a lot of uh, work on modernizing uh, all these activities by introducing AI elements, developing downstream analytics platforms, uh, introducing more of satellite-derived uh, analytics into the frameworks, and uh, also with a plan of going upstream, we just launched our first uh, SAR satellite uh, last month, and a constellation of eight SAR satellites will be in place in the next three, uh, three years followed up uh, with, with a few optical satellites, creating a very large multi-sensor constellation uh, over the next few years. At Space 42 from next week, uh, Space 42 is a merger between uh, Bayanath and Yasat. Yasat is a SATCOM uh, operator operating uh, geostationary satellites for communication purposes, but they're also working a lot on in, in the domain of IoT, providing uh, comm services for IoT applications. So this combination between Yasat and, and Bayanath uh, will become a, a very nice vertical integrator of upstream, midstream, and, and downstream domains in, in one place across Earth observation and communications. That's, uh, it would, <laughs> I'm very interested in seeing how this will pan out, but it's, it's a very, very interesting combination, putting all those things together. And um, we, are, we are hoping that you know, this will be successful very fast. So uh, coming to this domain, so uh, our interest is largely on, on, on um, building or democratizing both data at large scale and also analytics at large scale. Been, we've been working on a platform called GIQ over the last uh, couple of years, which is now uh, with a very, very accelerated uh, development schedule. Uh, it's going to go live commercially uh, in the beginning of next year. Uh, a beta version was already open, uh, and now we are fully commercializing in the beginning of next year. And with that, uh, we are hoping that you know a lot more things will will be put together in in, in place uh, to to adapt to the uh, fast changing AI domain and marrying it with geospatial data, which is also fast changing with so many new space players coming into the picture. Thanks, Prashant. So a fantastic qualified panel of subject matter experts representing uh, many of the existing but also emerging technologies in Earth observation. And I think it, it doesn't take very much conversation at an event like Energeo to understand that geospatial and Earth observation 
not only technologies, but data streams, analytics. Um, I love decision, actionable information. Uh, are going to play a, a vital role in the future of our shared sustainable uh, uh, global community, really. So with that in mind, I would ask each of you sort of within a general question uh, of how can Earth observation industry help shape a shared sustainable future? Uh, you know, I, I've heard you talk several times about IoT. I don't know if everybody here is familiar with what, what that truly means in the context of geospatial. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping you can share maybe a little insight on how technologies such as those that SpaceEye is involved with and IoT really do play an impact in everyday life of, of a sustainable future for us. Chris? Um, I'm not entirely sure where to start, but it's enormous. Um, uh, so IoT is your smartphone. It's your, it's your wearables. Uh, we do not emit signals. We are flesh and bone. Uh, so fundamentally, the thing that you carry, your device that you carry, determines your location. Your location, typically, would be on a map. And a map would show a wee blue dot, let's say, that would say, here is Chris on the map, yeah? Uh, if that was Google Earth, fantastic brand, uh, you'd actually have a wee blue dot in that too. But actually, the live data is the IoT data, it's a blue dot. The image behind that is static, yeah? So the difference between what we do and the current conventional solutions are that your data is on the image or it's on the map. Space Eye will place you or identify you in the image. So you're actually in the real-time satellite image and that's a differentiator. That gives you situation, situational awareness. It gives you the ability to make better, more informed decisions. Um, I had an example three weeks ago where we had two lawyers uh, in our offices. One came back the following day. His wife's a lawyer. For whatever reason, they both took cars I left the office at the same time. Husband left a minute before, because men are quite competitive, I believe, uh, and decided to leave the office first. Transpires, he gets a detour from Google Maps saying, take this detour. There was a big alert, comes up in his sat-nav, decides to, turn, to follow the route. Uh, five mile detour, 12 minutes in Scotland, which would be half an hour in London. Gets home and his wife's in the house already. He went, oh, what happened there? So he said, did you not take the detour? Transpires, like my wife, she doesn't read or watch sat-nav, doesn't like sat-nav, so we just drove straight home. No accidents, no roadworks, and got home before he did. So he started thinking about ESG, and I'll talk about that in a second. So the, the Corporate Sustainability uh, Due Diligence Directive by the European Union is significant for every major brand on the planet, with potential fines per annum of $191 billion. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But what actually happened was um, he started thinking about the ESG impact, the costs, fuel, time, etc. And so it took him 12 minutes extra. And I said, look, the, apart from the inconvenience, his name is Johnny, and he's a lawyer, so he's giving it in writing, because lawyers can't tell lies, apparently. But anyway, fundamentally, transpires. Um, I suggested to him, but imagine you were driving an ambulance. Somebody's dead, potentially, or more seriously injured than they were before. So that ability to potentially see the road in advance before you get to that point in real time, and that sounds fanciful today, because it is fanciful today, uh, but within 63 months, we reckon of an image of most points on Earth within every 10 to 40 seconds. Um, and that's really a differentiator and a game changer. On top of that, the thing we have to worry about is latency, getting the image down from space, but that's been worked on just now. People much more clever than I will look at that too. But quick, quickly on CSDDD, the ability to actually track and trace the entire uh, supply chain of the, some of the biggest brands on our planet, not just the operations within Europe, is actually within the gift of our organization. And a major technology company, as of Monday, started the build of our very first platform that industrializes our processes. So that ability to follow, track, and trace the entire supply chain and report on that and monitor that and the impact on human rights, on the impact on nature, as well as animals and plant life, and the ability to talk about the impact on the climate is something that we report the point and they fail to do so will result in 5% same as GDPR of uh, net profit uh, from that, that organization. This is game changing stuff and it will change ESG from being a reporting to the board to being on the board. So I think space will help ESG, it will help reporting. Corporate manslaughter changed the impact um, um, of, of having someone on the board because it, it, it were too taken seriously and we see that to be the case uh, looking forward to. So it's contexting, the, contextualizing the world in real time 
time from space is what we do, and we will do that in partnership. We're not looking to provide products, we're looking to enhance existing services and work with partners like the wonderful MDA, hopefully Esri at some point too, and all um, uh, suppliers of GIS data moving forward. I thought you said you weren't a technical guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. Um, thank you for that. Minda, staying within the context of the role of EO in shaping the future, I'd like to ask you to comment a little bit on how image helps us, imaging helps us understand climate. I think a lot of people uh, oftentimes believe that imaging is just a, an aerial photo or, or something that's in the visible spectrum, but we've seen a proliferation of SAR, of uh, near-infrared, of, of many different types of sensors that are being flown. How, how do we tie those things to, to understanding climate, to ESG, towards you know, looking, again, in the context of a sustainable future? So I, uh, as a data provider and from space, so if you think about satellite data, I think there's a recognized uh, number of metrics that monitor the health of the Earth and what's happening in terms of climate changes. And over 50 of those parameters cannot be measured except from space. So space really gives you that higher perspective uh, beyond just aerial. And what also space does is, depending on your orbital control and how you view the Earth, you can see things in a very specific and consistent way, which allows you to do things like change detection. So for example, radar for, uh, is used to, to monitor the polar ice right? And if you want to monitor how that coastal or, or all those ice is being eroded through climate change, you need to have a way to view it in a very large uh, area, as well as in a precise way that allows you to see the exact changes that happen. Because you might only see some of those changes happen uh, a small inches at a time or um, now that I'm Canadian, I should say meters, <laughs> but, uh, or and that I'm in Europe now, uh, but uh, you want to be able to monitor those changes in a very consistent way, and that's really what satellite data allows you to do. So not only can you see these different metrics that are out there, specifically I was speaking from the radar perspective, but also there are a lot of other satellites that do these metrics, other types of phenomenology, but and specifically radar. So we work very closely with the Canadian government, with NASA, with NOAA in the US to really monitor and map out in a temporal way uh, what's happening with uh, the uh, ice sheets uh, in the polar regions, for example. Fantastic, thank you so much. Kate, Minda gave us sort of this big picture. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to drill down a little bit to some specific use cases um, and something that, that impacts us all, which are natural hazards. How, how are imagery, how are Earth observation technologies in service of that sustainable future uh, being used in the context of natural hazards? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. And I think my, my fellow panelists have done a great job describing the why and the how we can use remote sensing. We have new uh, types of sensors that can detect things like wildfires, landslides, flooding. More and more of those uh, solutions are coming on board. But just because we have that data available does not necessarily mean it's accessible. Uh, or usable to the majority of people um, who it needs to get in the hands of. And so I like to think of natural disasters or something that impacts both uh, the public and decision makers as needing to go from data all the way up to decision making. So it starts with uh, maybe uh, just a, a, a single image of a wildfire. That's the, your first step. Uh, and then you can go to, okay, we have a map of all of the different wildfires in a specific region. And then you can measure how big the wildfires are. But when you really start uh, adding GIS data uh, or contextual data um, and build it on a platform, and I'll tug on the word sustainability a little bit. I know we're using it potentially in the, in the, in the form of climate. But uh, sustainable to me also means sustainable solutions for future generations as well. So if you build it once, you can continue to use it. It's traceable. You have accountability. 
Um, and so when you add in things like how many people live near a wildfire, um, how many of them have a car, can they evacuate, uh, how many of them speak the local language so you can communicate an evacuation, uh, those are all things that require a little more nuance and more in-depth solutions than just a single image. So uh, I find that users uh, are really hungry to be able to communicate uh, these really excellent and amazing new sensor types and data types coming on board, uh, but don't really know how yet. Uh, sociology research tells us that we have about 30 seconds to show a decision maker uh, some sort of graphic for them to lose interest or make a decision off of it. So you can't, you don't have five minutes to explain SAR or thermal or how big a pixel is or uh, how, how big the fire is, or this is what we estimate the accuracy to be in our machine learning model. It has to be quick and it has to show real solutions. Um, and, and that way it's sustainable, traceable, usable, uh, and actually accessible, not just available. That's great, I really like that. I think it's important. Uh, we should talk more about communication because we have a lot of wonderful technologies and sometimes they're not used to their fullest potential because we're not communicating them in meaningful ways. So I feel like that's really important. Thanks for that. Prashant, I'm gonna challenge you here uh, with an AI question, given your background. I think certainly from my point of view, it seems like sometimes when people talk about AI in Earth observation, it's, it's treated almost as if it was a seasoning, something to be sprinkled on top of, of everything else to make it better. Um, and clearly, I think the potential of that goes well beyond a, a seasoning. Um, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit how AI plays a role in Earth observation, analytics, and any needed, you know, some say policy is behind on, on this topic, but really in service of that sustainable future. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I sh we share your pain, Kate. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I'll start from there now. Um, Analytics now, it's like AI is a new jargon right now. It's like this, this has been a pain of remote sensing for, for decades now, right? Trying to make sense of the data. So just by the nature of how data is collected uh, for remote sensing, it's very different from the regular imaging techniques. Now we have to understand that first in a way, right? So, uh, and AI, I mean, is, is a jargon, but you know, it's like it's garbage in, garbage out most of the time. So we have to be very, very, very careful when you're saying, when you're sprinkling that salt and pepper on, on the top of uh, things, right? So object-oriented, or, or what is objective-oriented, analytics development is the key here, right? Now, it's broad, so it's not, we cannot simply simplify this thing in, into a set of blocks and say that this is how things work in a way, no? It's very complicated, because, and, and more on, on the top of that, you have a complicated pre-processing step that we have to take care of to especially deal with remote sensing data. And then when you're talk, talking about remote sensing data, it's not just one type of data. It's not a, it's, it's not a CCTV camera feed, right? You have sensors like SAR, op, optical, hyperspectral, thermal. There are a lot of things that are coming up. Over the last few years now, you have, you have so much data that is coming up in, in, into, the, into the domain, uh, largely because of all these new space developments. So the Resolutions are increasing, so we, are, we have access to a wide range of resolutions, both spatial and, and temporal. And on the top of that now, we completely new applications that were not even considered before are, are coming into the picture as well and, and creating a bit of new markets. So now, going back to your challenge, you know, how, how would you position AI and how would you position AI within the frameworks of policies and, and all those things, right? There are a lot of things coming in, but one of the things that, that is really, really missing is making operational use cases, right, that will enter into the operational mandates of agencies. We are talking about sustainability here. How many of these environment agencies around the world use remote sensing data on a regular, I'm not saying they're not using that, they're using it regularly from time to time on a number of things, but how many of them are really using remote sensing data as a day-to-day -day monitoring exercise? Right? Where is that data flowing? How is that embedded into their existing mandates? How is that supporting their existing mandates? This discussion doesn't ha happen very often. It's, it's always use case specific where you go pick a use case, develop an application, 
and then solve the problem, close it there, and, and move on, right? So we need to go back one step, go back to understand what are the actual needs of those people who are going to use your data? And you are, who, who, what is their actual need? Do they need data or, or an insight, for instance, like Kate mentioned, no? And timely insights are, are very important, right? How do we embed these challenges into existing mandates and then grow from there? That's, that's how we should be probably working on, on things when you have to develop AI applications on the top of that, right? It's not just AI, any, any analytical application layer, AI is a, jargon word that's added there, but any analytic application on the, on the top of that. So for example, now, with SAR data, just to take this example, with largely because of the work that was done over several decades now, uh, with radar SAR, terra SAR, now with Sentinel uh, satellites, land subsidence mapping is becoming a common, sol common solution that is like, you know, almost available for almost everyone. Uh, but is that really entering into operational requirements of agencies, municipalities, for instance, or all things? No, not yet. This technology is there around for, for decades now. It's maturing now with more and more satellite data coming into the picture, but did it enter into the operational domains? We still have to go educate people, plead them to look into this thing and continuously use that, and then eventually fig figure out how to help their mandates, right? These type of things have to come in. So. So to enable these things, now we, of course we need to support policies. And policies are not global as well, right? They're always local. So if we can come up with, WGIC's role should be <laughs> this thing now, to actually come up with kind of policy supporting reports or documents which will help you know, the policymakers in individual regions to take up their general guidelines and say, now, these are the technologies that are available. These can go into these applications. And now, if these, these can become mandates, ex because converting, uh, so if you want to embed your, a new technology into an existing mandate, it's a three-year process. It doesn't happen immediately, right? So you need to do that exercise from, from now to slowly educate them and then, not slowly, you have to educate them very fast, actually and then make sure that this gets embedded into the existing mandates through regional policy making. So that, that, that's what should happen now, especially with so much data that is going to hit us. Great, that's thank, thank you so much. And your comments dovetail very nicely into my next question um, with, with, around policy, because policy is one dimension of what I would call non-technical factors that challenge any any sort of common usage of technology. Um, and so I would ask each of you maybe to provide your thoughts on whether, whether it's on future policy, but I also am hearing conversations around funding and sustainability of these, these types of technologies, around the politics of it. Um, we've seen most recently, even with uh, tools that have emerged such as ChatGPT, where entire countries have geofenced off their their country and said, you can't use that here, even though it's, it's being used everywhere else in the world. Um, so just what are, what are some of the non-technical, I know we're at a technical conference, but what are some of the non-technical things that you see being challenges or that need to really come along with the technology in order to make it something that can be used each and every day? Let's, let's start with Minda this time. <laughs> okay, uh, relative to, to policy, I think that uh, what I see that's really exciting about AIML, which, by the way, has been a, a part of the discussion along the Earth observation value chain for a long time, you know, from the build, design, all the way through the operations piece to the data, providing the data or doing the analytics, there, AIML has always been a part, for over 50 years, we've been developing types of optimizations, ways uh, to leverage that. What I think is really exciting is when it becomes part of the commercial discussion, right? And the conversation around AI through chat GPT and other types of technologies like that, really the innovation when it enters into uh, the more commercial, broader uh, conversation is really important. And I've seen a little bit of a shift. I grew up on the defense and intel side, and I see that there was always a lot of innovation there. But I see now the shift of innovation more towards commercial. And once you get those techniques and uh, 
and everyone in the market is able to access that value, access what AI can do, and uh, can then add their own innovation on and develop it in new ways. I think that's, that's what was exciting about chat GPD. Policy tends to always lag a bit, right, as these technologies are developed. And so uh, the recognition, I think, of the use of AI ML certainly has been recognized in certain areas, but maybe just in a very controlled way. Now that it's kind of been out in the public domain uh, and more accessible, that kind of technology development and innovation kind of takes off and policy always has to play a bit of catch up. So I've always seen that in uh, different technologies that have evolved and moved around from uh, the defense side into the commercial world and then vice versa. So I think that, uh, but there is still a little bit of fear associated with certain technology, and especially around AI. It was funny, I was talking to my mom the other day, and she's like, isn't AI a bad thing? I'm like, no, it's a great tool. <laughs> it can really help enhance the world and, and the way that we see data. And uh, it just, she just was like, oh, it sounds really scary to me. So I think that it is, uh, it is about education. It is about making sure that uh, with customers, both uh, I think on the defense and intel side, but also on the commercial and business side, to bring them along and educate as the technology grows and what, where the innovation takes place and what it can do for them in the future it becomes an important part. And once people start seeing that value, you can open up those policy discussions and start applying, hey, does it go a bit too far? Do we need to have some guide rails around privacy, around ways in which AI is applied in, in, in different data sets? Do we curate the data sets, sets in such a way so it doesn't allow you to make the connections that instead of just identifying a person, you identify an individual? And that's what I think makes people worry and think that there has to be more policies and regulations around that. I think that's really important. Thank you for that. I, I get concerned and I, I think we need more conversation around the realities that innovation and technology run at a certain RPM, if you will, and government and policy runs by its very nature at a different RPM. Um, I always think back to like when, when you see a uh, cars blinkers that are out of sync and then they are in sync. They were never in sync. They just happened to be coming around again to, to appear that way. And there's there's a lot of work to do in this space. And, and it feels sometimes like by the time the policy catches up to what we're talking about here on stage today, we're two or three iterations ahead of that again, technically. And so I think it is a responsibility of the industry to help educate and, and uh, bring policymakers along on that journey. Um, any feedback on that, uh, Kate, or, or something else? Yeah, I think along those lines, I, we, I think sitting in the commercial world, uh, even in the research or academic world, we sit in a place where we are excited about the ways that AI and imagery, um, Earth observation can solve different um, health issues uh, around the planet and be diagnostic, but <clears throat> uh, when we're talking about policy, we're, we're actually talking about government, which moves truly the slowest out of any, any single organization around the world, right? And um, to be able to use these really amazing technologies that we're coming up with, these solutions that we see uh, that our brilliant engineers and uh, team members are coming up with, what we hear feedback from in the federal space, the, in the US, in the state, state and local government, is that if it's not written into policy, they may not be able to use uh, Earth observation. So a big example of that in the US is our Federal uh, Emergency Management Administration, FEMA. And they, there's not a single line in their regulatory policy that says it's OK to use drones, it's OK to use satellite imagery in order to make X, Y, Z decision. And so in order to avoid litigation, liability, they can't. So they can use the technology to be a diagnostic, to maybe get a heads up on where they should be looking, but they can't give that to a decision maker and then say, okay, I'm, I'm putting aid here, I'm, I'm giving, uh, we're, we're sending water here, 
um, those things need to actually be written. So the policy truly does need to actually be codified um, in order for it to be accessible for end users. And I think one of the interesting, excuse me, one of the interesting um, consequences is that a lot of the innovation uh, for disaster response and that type of thing has come from developing countries and third world countries that don't necessarily have uh, robust policy or federal government uh, agencies that that uh, can sustain and then deploy and maintain regulations around Earth observation. Great. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to Chris here and and ask the same question about uh, non-technical forces that are impacting sort of the future that you see. Where do I start? <laughs> so I'll take Minda's point firstly, uh, that policy and laws are slow. They're also slow to reverse. And actually, that's a danger too. Because fundamentally, we're all a bit limited uh, in certain parts of the world by and restricted by rules, regulations and policy to the point where it's actually disadvantageous to our agencies and our people and it's putting people at risk, it's putting countries at risk, it's putting ideology at risk as well. So I'm quite direct with my feedback on this one. So let, let's, uh, let's get ready for this. So this is the Glaswegian telling you as it is, okay? So we have a situation where we have the Wassenaar Arrangement. The Wassenaar Arrangement was crafted in, 20, in 1999, uh, updated in 2013, which seems like last century now, let's be clear, in terms of technology. Um, the French, God love them, uh, they decided that the Wassenaar Arrangement was having a detrimental impact on their agencies and the good guys, girls as well by the way, uh, in, in their country in terms of quantum development. And what they did is they decided to change the law and remove that restriction because in friendly nations or potentially malign in scenarios and or forces were using that against um, their own agencies in many ways by not being restricted um, by the actual rules and regulations that are set in place uh, to protect for all the right reasons in a time that was the dark ages in technological terms but they have to change quickly, really, really quickly. And I've been to Washington recently and I've been to the UK and various other uh, governments. There's a recognition that we need to move. We need to move quickly, more adeptly and actually fundamentally we need to catch a grip quite honestly, when it comes to technology and it comes to laws as well. So we need to be quick to respond and quick to reverse and agile. If we're not agile in technology, technological terms, that's a disaster. If we're not agile from a governmental and rules perspective, that's equally a disaster. There are geopolitical elements at play globally and we have to recognise that too. So I think fundamentally laws are great. But we have to obviously apply, what does it they say, um, uh, rules are for wise men and, uh, sorry, what does it say, rules are for fools and guidelines are for wise men, I think is a phrase that was always used in the past. But fundamentally, I think we need to be a bit pragmatic about this and understand where we are in the world, what's happening, the technology is changing at a pace that's catching everyone by surprise, where there were 620 Earth observation satellites in 2017, this year will be 1,657, and by 2030, 63 months from now, there will be nearly 12,000. That's a satellite with imaging capability passing overhead every 10 to 40 seconds on average. That's a game changer and we need to understand the implications of that, the benefits of that, the opportunities around that too. And AI is really important, but AI just classifies. What we bring to the party, so I, I, I'm a bit of a pitch here, space AI identifies. So it's the difference between identifying and classifying and that, that personalization of data will mean the difference between life and death. Quick example, that's one final point. I spoke to someone yesterday who talked about the wildfires in, in California and actually one system, one mapping system, um, no names, no pack drill as such, but it's, it's just to give an idea is actually was actually picking up that there was traffic going towards the fire. So they thought actually the road was open, but they didn't they differentiate that that was actually a fire engine. So they were directing civilians in cars to, to the road must be clear. So we need to be a bit more data sensitive. Personalization of data is critical in my view as well. But policies and laws can restrict and can enhance, but we need to move more quickly and more agile. Perfect. One common theme I'm hearing here so far is doing the thing right and doing the right thing are quite different uh, when it comes to, to some of these technologies. Rashawn, I'd ask you to, to wrap us up here on, on non-technical yeah, issues. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll take a very nice example that is happening recently in India, in my hometown in India. There's now a government action. So 
normally around any water body, be it rivers or, or lakes or ponds and all those things, you have a buffer zone to help water bodies grow and shrink and all those things, right? And with time, of course, there will be illegal encroachments of these things. And over the last few years, a few months or few weeks actually, the government has started taking action and basically destroying all those illegal encroachments. That's one thing. That's, that's a good thing they're doing. And guess what they're using? They're, of course, using historical satellite imagery. Now there's something very interesting happening, non-technical. Now a lot of these people, semi-technical people, let's call, started looking at what is available. Google Earth, for instance, Big Maps, where you have historical data, started posting on social media, Instagram or whatever, on how anyone can actually install an app on your phone. Uh, because of the digital revolution in India recently, now we have one billion WhatsApp users. Everyone has internet and, and smartphone uh, nowadays, right? No? Now, they're giving us, giving these tools now, right? No, it's, this is very powerful, you know, this is happening in front of our eyes. Now, they're showing how easy it is to access this data, see in your region what is happening historically, using this little app you can put on your phone and see. Now, on a daily basis over the last few weeks, add at least one WhatsApp forward every day, showcasing these videos where people are explaining how a normal person can actually simply look at what is happening in their region with this thing. Now you see, it's a, it's a reverse. It's not coming top down. Now, bottom up, normal people, when they're exposed to these tools, can start forcing policies. The government cannot back down anymore now. People have the tools in their hand, right? And this is, this is so powerful happening. This is the combination of all this revolution that is happening, data access, access to internet, for instance, or access to data and all those things, and education at that level. That is so powerful, and that is happening <laughs> at a non-technical level. And on the other spectrum, the people who are providing these services now should also be very proactive. UAE, for instance, last couple of years, last few years, we're seeing floods, unprecedented floods in a way. It doesn't rain so much, but when it rains, it's it pours now and recently because of, it's, it's a large scale phenomenon, right? It's not a localized phenomenon because of changing, climate change largely, because of changing all, uh, climate, uh, sorry, ocean, uh, ocean circulation patterns and so on, because uh, around the monsoon season when, when the winds are supposed to go to India from, from, from the uh, ocean, they're deviating and then hitting uh, the Arabian Peninsula and we're experiencing more and more rains. That's one of the factors among others. Now. The region is clearly not prepared, as you can see. You know, it's like videos coming out showing, you know, Dubai getting flooded uh, up to the first floor, second floor, and so on and so on, right? So the providers li like us now have to be very, very proactive. So it's not simple, right? Now, satellite data is not just available when you want. You have to plan that carefully. So what we did, as an example, is we s we embedded, automated an entire system where we took weather forecasting centralized to create much more localized models to the level of 500 meters to one kilometer grids or, or at least two kilometer grids, where we are very certain because satellite data is still expensive. So I cannot just simply scan the entire country. I need to be really, really precise to get those exact locations where I have to get a picture and support when things are happening. Till now, everything is reactive, right? Floods happen, then you, you task a satellite, get the data, map, and Things are late, you know, we are not ready, we are not really solving a problem there in a way, right? But if I can give that data in a timely manner, exactly at the time when the event is happening, that's much, much more valuable, right? So what we started doing it is, now it's like, again, we were hit and we were asked a question and we were not ready, so we have to come up with a solution. So we introduced this entire schematic where we use the weather forecasting, clearly pinpoint and, and a bit of hydro modeling to exactly see which regions are going to be flooded and then task a satellite Pay, uh, tasking eight hours to one day in advance. When, and we have data exactly when the event is happening and we produce maps clearly. That's, that's a real use of AI, right? Now AI is now helping me to map those zones in seconds or minutes. And as soon as I get the satellite data, in a few minutes, I'm just delivering the results. This type of proactiveness will help a lot in terms of propagating these things and helping it be part of policies in a way.
Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead. Can I add one extra uh, point to this? Because I think it's quite really, really relevant. There are no rules in space. There are no laws for space. And that's something that's a major concern to go back. This is a policy point, really, to be honest. So the feedback we're getting just now from the UK and US parties we're speaking to without getting into too much detail is that our patents could form the basis of the framework for, the standards of, the laws of space. Because actually 32 billion IoT devices and that data being freely used and made available to everyone doesn't make any sense from a privacy perspective either. So I think we need to effectively uh, geopolitically and internationally agree how we interact with that data uh, from space if we're to move forward in a way that's sensible and within uh, certain circumstances too. So we're excited by that, we're very proud of that potentially too. So we don't, we don't disregard and don't like laws and rules, we're just saying let's just be, let's adapt and be agile when we, when we do so. Perfect, thanks. Uh, amazingly, we're, we're starting to run out of time here already. <laughs> Uh, but as we close, I, I'd like to turn the conversation slightly more technical again, uh, in the sense that, I, you know, no one ever says, I wish I had less data. <laughs> you know, it, everybody wants more data and more data, but I'm also mindful that, to, to use a, a somewhat EO example of LiDAR data, when people say I want LiDAR data, they don't really mean that. They want a better model, they want a better contour map, they want something that's a derivative of that. So with that in mind, I mean, we've seen innovation, we've seen evolution of sensors, of techniques for decades in EO processing. As Minda said, we've been doing AI for, a <laughs> before it was called AI. And, uh, you know, we, we get better resolution, revisit times, collected spectrums, et cetera. Uh, in our pre-call for this, this panel today, I was also struck, someone, and apologies, I don't remember the attribution, said that data don't solve problems. You know? And so I think that really hit, hit home with me. So in that, given that background, again, as we, we close up here in the last 10 minutes, how do we leverage Earth observation in the future to get the actual insights from the massive data sets that maybe are not initially uh, what we need to make a decision so that, and again, to Kate's point, we're going to have a very narrow window of time to put something in front of a decision maker if we're hoping to have any impact on the outcome. So uh, we'll start at the end and work our way back. Okay. So as I mentioned before, you know, it's like objective is the key thing, right? You know, what, what objective are you solving, right? So it's not about a lot of data, but it's a lot of right data that is very important, both for, for the sake of analytics and also for the sake of building the right uh, uh, baseline models on, on, on which you can build, build things, right? So clearly, no amount of data will be enough, <laughs> to be very honest, because as you keep on adding data, new applications will pop up, and, and there's always a lot to do, you know, right? So it's all about fixing the objective first and channeling the right data to solve that objective, right? So, like I mentioned, for floods, for instance, we clearly know that you know it's like it has to come timely. It has to be the radar data because when you are when you have floods, you know there are clouds. There's no optical data, right? You know, so but a lot of data radar data is needed as well to actually track continuously how how floods are propagating and and which areas are damaged. And then on the top of that, you need to add the GIS layers that are already available. For instance, infrastructure buildings or whatever. Uh, to help or, or logistic support for the responders to go on, on ground and all those things, right? So these are all the data sets that are needed for that particular objective, right? Data, we're not talking about limiting data. A lot of data is still needed, but then you're actually limi limiting to the right data, but a lot of right data. That's, that's my uh, opinion here. All right, thank you very much, Kate. Yeah, Aaron, I couldn't tell if you were baiting me because I was the one that disagreed with you. That said, um, that I don't necessarily think that we hear from users uh, that we need more data to agree. We need the, the right type of data, and we need a way to uh, be able to shape that data into something actionable. So that comes down to things that are less sexy and less interesting, like data management, uh, data sharing, data visualization, and then finally dashboards and ways to get the data and insights across to whoever needs to hear it most. Um, so we have a lot of data. We have a lot of the commercial satellite imagery has taken off in the last 10 years. 
Um, even if we had three centimeter hyperspectral SAR, optical, uh, thermal, you name it for the entire globe, every day, every hour, we'd still need a way to manage that data, share it across organizations, and then understand and, and get to those insights. Uh, so I think that that's the, the long-term goal is in having that in all one solution and putting the power in the user's hands who know their location, their community, their industry, uh, their village, whatever, ha whatever it may be, they know it best. Um, we hear a lot about foundational models uh, these days globally. Um, Agriculture is a, is a particularly big one, but a lot of that data is trained in the U.S., and we have some pretty wacky crop circles uh, in the U.S., and they don't really look like agricultural areas elsewhere in the world. Um, and so we run it, we get high accuracy because it's trained and tested in similar areas, but weirdly it doesn't do anything uh, particularly well in Africa or South America. And, uh, you know, I was, on another, I was on another panel and someone said, in, in terms of foundational models with agriculture, farmers want to farm. They just want something to tell them, do I water today? Do I fertilize here? How's my crop doing? What should I plant next season? Um, where should I send it? What's the easiest place to get you know, the highest revenue? Um, we talk really high about technologies and AI solving problems, but at the end of the day, we actually have to get down to brass tacks and and do the doing. Yeah, perfect, Minda. So I also think about the diversity of data, right? It's not just, uh, I find that especially in Earth observation, to solve the ever evolving uh, problems uh, through climate change, through mission needs, through everyone having different, uh, different market verticals, trying to address different needs, it's not a single solution. And so you need to be able to share and collaborate across not only data sets uh, internationally through uh, country collaboration and through industry collaboration. That becomes a really important part of the discussion in order to really approach and get the problem solved. Because I, there's never going to be a single data set answer for every single mission or every single problem that needs to happen. And so that's what I really enjoy about being a part of the Earth observation community, is that we understand that the need is a collaboration throughout, uh, throughout the diversity of data sets, throughout the diversity of tools and data sets and capabilities. So that's really where I see uh, the uh, interest and the drive to move forward with the multiple data sets is understanding that, oh, you might have that data set for today, I need that type of data that tomorrow, we need to be able to come together to solve my customers' problems and in real time. So I, I really think that's, uh, that's another part of the discussion as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Um, I would add metadata to your comment about the unsexy things. I think one of the things that people are finding out about ChatGPT, uh, you know, we, we have the term data hallucinations in our lexicon now, is the they're finding where there's absent metadata, you have no confidence in the outputs. And so uh, that's, a, that's a really important piece. And I, and I enjoyed your comments as well, Minda, on uh, the need for some of the, the working together. I spent part of my career working with planetary scientists, and it's amazing how well all the scientists work together whenever you get data from Pluto, because there's only one data stream coming back, and everybody's going to have to play nice with it. Um, and so their metadata is incredibly robust, and their data protocols are incredibly developed, not because they want them to be necessarily, but out of necessity, because they know that's the only way that those systems are going to work. And so hopefully we can learn a little something from what they're doing there uh, where appropriate. So bring us home, Chris. We have about two minutes left uh, to get your thoughts. So um, not being the doctor, or the only doctor, or not doctor on the panel, I think it's important to demystify because I've never heard so much jargon in my life, to be honest. So I'm, I'm a new person coming into the sector. 
and it's just rife with jargon. I mean, I need a, a lexicon to understand half the things that have been said sometimes. So I think we need to simplify that. We need to make it more useful to take uh, Kate's point as well. So if this is about user, user, usability. And visual data for me is the best data. So Earth observation is the best way to observe and contextualize our planet, in my opinion. And, and I'm sure you'll agree with that panel as well. But fundamentally, it's about use cases as well. And people always say, so what's a use case? How could you use this? And Kate and I had a wee conversation uh, just yesterday, actually. And we were talking about wildfires. So taking a nice satellite picture of a wildfire is, is pretty. It's dangerous, but at night time it looks very pretty. But fundamentally, it's really a dangerous thing. And it's killing people. It's, it's eating up assets. And it's killing the, 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 um, the, our planet in terms of global boiling as well. But the ability to actually see where the, the responders are and the actual fire engines are in that picture is a game changer. That's when you, you create um, efficiencies from a command and control perspective, you save lives, you save livestock, you actually mitigate risks, and you put the fire out hopefully 40% earlier, because that impact has a massive knock-on impact on the rest of the planet too. So actually, it's not about data, it's about making it usable, useful data, turning it into something we can all use as actual insights uh, and help change the planet. Perfect. And. Join me in thanking all of our panelists again. We'll have to leave the discussion there, uh, but it's been a great discussion, and I think I have a lot more questions also <laughs> that, that we could use for, for a future panel on this same topic. So thank you very much. And you can, you're welcome to stick around. We have our next session following this immediately is on infrastructure and sustainable future, and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you.